Divine Truth Interviews Jesus, Mary and others are interviewed by members of the media and the public. Mary interviews Jesus on the subject of partner relationships. Recorded on the 20th of October 2015 in Wilkesdale, Queensland, Australia. This is Session 3, Part 1. Welcome again to one of our recording sessions. Um, this is Partner Relationships, Session 3. And myself and Mary are discussing more questions that we've received about partner relationships. So what we'd like to do firstly, though, is revise the first two sessions of partner relationships. And the very first session focused on the two primary questions that we had to ask ourselves if we're in a relationship. And I believe that the two primary questions we need to ask ourselves at all times, all the time, <laughs> <laughs> rather than just in a relationship. Yeah. So, Mary, maybe you could mention those two questions for us. Sure. So the first question is about love, yeah. and it's about how to love. It is what does pure love do? Mm. Now we ask that question if we don't believe in God. Mm -hmm. If we do believe in God, then we then we ask ourselves, what does God's love do? Yes. So I feel it's Im important in that in that to make sure that people understand that. Even in a relationship, if there is no belief in God, the two parties can ask themselves, what does pure love do? Mm. Which is often very, very different to what they believe, you know, love should do or what they personally would do. And I think, think if they have that focus, it will help them with that first question. Yeah. Mm. The second question to ask is about desire. Yes. And the question is, if we don't believe in God, do I really want to love in a pure way yes and if we do believe in god then do i really want to love god's way yes uh, and I, it's such an essential question isn't it like yeah. because it, with, without those without that question being asked we're basically saying i'm going to have my version of love mm -hmm. and you're going to have your version of love and the two versions of love at times may agree and then the two versions of love at times may not agree and when they don't agree what are we going to do <laughs> well most of the time that's when people have great big fights and arguments and eventually <laughs> even break up and this is where we need to have both in a relationship need to have a commitment to what does pure love do what and and if you have a love of god and have received some of god's love you have a much better idea of what pure love is and therefore you can ask yourself the question what would god's love do in this situation yeah mm -hmm. and that supplement oh sorry not the, the second question that we ask um do i really want to do this yes. this is where i feel people are not very honest at times really no. a lot of times they need to face actually i don't really want to yes and in fact um, in fact that it raises this question of will which is one of the first things we're going to discuss today in this session yeah, yeah. but then the, in the uh, first in the first partner relationships group there was also four supplemental questions That's which right. were asked so perhaps we can go through those yeah so, and we talked about these, especially when we encounter a situation in our relationship or even a source of conflict. And the first question is, what would love, what would my love for myself motivate me to do for myself? Yes. So this is all about, if I really loved myself, what would I do for myself rather than expecting other people to do it for me? Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's about the responsibilities of loving yourself, really. And, uh, and it's a very good question to ask oneself. What would I do if I really loved myself? Second question, what would love for my partner motivate me to do for my partner? Yes, um, a lot of the times we're very interested in our relationship being satisfied from our perspective, yeah. but not very concerned about our, relation, uh, our partner being satisfied, yeah. um, which is a big problem in a relationship and obviously causes the degradation of relationships. So this particular question focuses on if I really loved my partner, what would I do for my partner? And now I'm talking now not, not about my definition of what real love would mm -hmm. do, but rather what God's definition or what pure love would do. Yeah. And often I find that people have more clarity about that when they observe someone else's relationship or somewhere where they're not emotionally involved. They can see clearly, look, if that person really loved the other one, they'd do this. Or if that person really loved the other one, they'd do that. Yes. But when it comes to their own relationship, suddenly perspective is lost and as we're going to talk about today in the session, a yeah. lot of other things come into play. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Supplemental question number three. What do I feel my partner's love for his or herself would motivate them to do for his or herself? Yes. This is about evaluating what we believe love of self means 
and and applying love as self equally amongst uh, for ourselves and for our partner. So in other words, we're saying here, if my partner really loved themselves, what would they do for themselves rather than putting on to me to do for them? And uh, and also, what would they do if they really love themselves? How would they treat themselves? Mm -hmm. And this is a very good question that we need to ask ourselves quite often. What we demand as love of ourselves is very different to what we think the other person should do for themselves. Yeah. And uh, and quite often there's quite a lot of inequality in that area, which causes a lot of degradation of relationships. Yeah. Question number four that we discussed was, mm -hmm. what do I feel my partner's, partner's love for me would motivate them to do for me? Yes. So this is now asking myself from my perspective, if I'm looking at my partner, what if they really loved me, what would they be doing? Mm -hmm. Right. So this is the kind of thing, question that still needs to be asked because quite frequently we allow our partners to what I would classify as get away with <laughs> unloving behaviour towards ourselves. Yeah. And a lot of times because we also want to them to allow us to get away oh, with wow. unloving behaviour towards them as well. Yeah. Often we have that motivation. But sometimes it's not that at all. We often have not very a good opinion of ourselves. And as, as a result, we have a tendency to allow our partner to do things towards ourselves that they should not do. And if they truly loved God's way, would never we consider do. doing. Yeah. Mm. What I do love, though, is that is the last in a series of six questions that we would ask ourselves Correct. very often because we haven't considered what pure love would do and exactly. if we really want to love and what love of ourselves and what love of our partners would look like. We, we are demanding certain things. What do I feel my partner's love for me would motivate them to do that coming from a very injured perspective of what we decide yes. what love would be like. Yes, I feel like most people only ask that one question of the six. Exactly. Of the entire six questions, the only question most people are interested in answering is what should my partner do for me if they love me? <laughs> and they're not interested in any other answer to any other question. Obviously, the, this is a big problem in relationships. If you're just selfishly interested in what your partner should do for you, then I suggest you, you're going to run through many, many partners mm -hmm. <laughs> and you'll eventually end up with a partner that has no love of themselves, which will cause a lot of problems anyway in your relationship if you keep having that attitude. So these are very, very good questions to ask ourselves. So what we've encouraged you to do, the viewer, is to ask yourselves those questions. Now, now in this session today, what we're going to do is extend these basic questions and start putting in principles of humility, love and truth into the basis of these questions. And so we're going to uh, ask a lot of different questions. Hopefully we get to the 10 that we've planned, but really you, you know so. how it goes. A lot of times <laughs> we talk too much and, and it doesn't work out that way. But um, what we would like to do is describe what like love, truth and humility really looks like in a relationship so that you can see how love, truth and humility will be reflected inside of your own personal relationships. And then once we've covered that material, then we'll get on to answering some of your questions about the base, you know, different questions that people have sent us in about different relationship issues and problems that they're actually having. Mm -hmm. So that's our presentation for you today. I hope you enjoy it. What does humility look like in a relationship? Yes, one of the very first questions I feel a couple needs to ask themselves. If they were both humble, what that would they be doing inside of the relationship? Now, obviously, there's so many things we could cover here. Yeah. And, and we've only constructed a very, very short list of things to go through. But humility has very wide ranging effects in our life. And in fact, we have done presentations before about humility itself. And there is many things or many qualities or aspects of humility that we would need to consider if we truly considered this particular question. So my suggestion to a couple is to have a look at the material presented about humility that we've already presented on our website, the videos and audios and the, and the written material, and ask themselves that question and create a list for themselves. 
you know, this is something you can do for yourself in your relationship in terms of growing close in your relationship, is to sit down together, work your, both, both of you, work your way through what humility would look like if you were both being humble at any one point in time. Mm. But what we'll do now probably is go through the individual uh, answers to that question yeah. of what, just some, just some examples that people can look at so that they can see the difference between humility and a lack of humility in the relationship. Right. Yeah. Okay, well, the first one we've listed is that I and my partner accept God's truth rather than holding on to personal false beliefs or accepting the false beliefs of our partner. Yes. You could say um, if you didn't believe in God that you hold on to universal truth. In other words, something is truthful whether one or both of you believe it not to be. And if you believe in God and you actually started to accept some of God's truth, then the question becomes, what would I do if both my partner and myself wanted to have God's truth as our personal opinion? Mm -hmm. So this, this is all about giving up your personal opinions. Yeah. And this is where I notice most couples in a relationship have a lot of difficulty. Mm -hmm. They want to hold on to their personal opinions all the time. And the problem with personal opinions is it's been coloured by your life experience. In other words, you've grown up with these opinions, which are often set in your family. They're often inaccurate when it comes to love, truth and humility. And they're often also quite wrong morally and ethically. And so we need to start questioning our personal opinions and in fact being willing to have this underlying willingness mm -hmm. to give up personal opinion, to not value your personal opinion at all all in fact is where you need to head and this is something that i find a lot of people struggle with in conversation with them they're struggling with giving up their own concept of what they believe to be true and actually recognizing that actually what they believe to be true doesn't actually matter at all <laughs> and and it's very important that both parties uh, both parties both couple in the couple mm -hmm. both par parties in the partnership recognize that their own personal opinions don't really matter at all right? yeah i find it funny <laughs> because i often have this image of like a candle in a rainstorm or a huge gust of wind and if we think of our personal opinion like that tiny little flame and we're doing everything to protect it and protect it but god's whole universe is designed to expose the untruth we have within us. Yes. And if that to means blow the blowing out. out that candle, <laughs> it's going to happen one way or another. Yes. And yet people expend, and I've done it myself, expend so much energy in trying to protect this piddly little flame um, when in fact letting go of it leads to more freedom Correct. anyway. Correct. So uh, this is a very important aspect of this quality of humility, being able to actually not value your own opinions at all. Mm -hmm. Now, the majority of people on the planet struggle deeply with that. Their own opinions are what they live by generally. <laughs> and so they really struggle to let go of their own opinions in acceptance of some other truth. Now, I'm not suggesting you let go of your opinions uh, in acceptance of a lie, mm -hmm. but when something else is proven to you, to you to be truthful, then you need to learn to accept it immediately. And the, the more rapidly you accept it, the easier it will be for you. Yeah. And this is why it's so important to understand that principle of humility. Yeah. People often attach a lot of their sense of worth to being right about yes. issues, don't they? Yes. When really the two issues are completely separate, their worth is completely independent Correct. of whether they're wrong or right on Correct. whatever the issue is. Yes. And if you look at it from God's perspective, God knows everything. So from God's perspective, our own opinions are probably mostly wrong. <laughs> Which is exactly the second thing on our list exactly. that, of what, what humility looks like in a relationship. Correct. We both admit that, look... We're probably wrong. We're probably both wrong. Yeah, we're probably <laughs> both of us wrong, at least in some part about whatever the issue is that yes. we're facing. Yes. Now, there are times, of course, when in a relationship, one person has learnt something in love or in truth that the other person has yet to learn. And there's also times in a relationship where we've had certain background where, you know, for example, if one party in the relationship has had an abusive childhood, then obviously their concepts of love are probably more distorted than a person who's had a very, very loving childhood. And so obviously the person who's had the loving childhood may find that they have God's opinion more frequently than the other. 
But we need to both be aware that we both probably at times are going to be completely wrong. And in fact, uh, when we begin the process of working towards pure love, it's, there's a high likelihood that we're both quite wrong most of the time. And in fact, our definitions of love are quite skewed and damaged and we need to repair them somehow. And the, the only way we're going to start repairing them is by firstly seeing that they are actually out of harmony with ethics and morality. So, so that's the only way that we're going to actually begin to repair something by seeing it's wrong. And if we can't admit we're wrong, we're going to have a huge difficulty seeing <laughs> something's are. wrong. <laughs> we are. And so what we're talking about is not just globally saying, oh, look, I'm wrong about everything. We're not saying throw out your logic. But throw out. we need to say that there is the potential that that is actually true. Exactly. <laughs> we <laughs> that do. we're wrong about almost everything. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. I mean, without uh, we, we need to still investigate. And Correct. this humble attitude is about investigating, which is why we're willing to admit well, it's not just about investigating, it's also about being willing to accept that you're wrong and willing to accept an opinion that is demonstrably true or more loving or more humble than what your current opinion is. So that requires a degree of humility that the, I find the majority of people on the planet don't seem to have at this point, but, but it is necessary in a really loving relationship. Mm. Mm. Yeah. All right, next one mm -hmm. follows closely on with that. I and my partner do not have an arrogant belief in ourselves. Yes. Now, you see this comes usually through childhood injuries where one or both parents have taught the child that it is the centre of the parent's universe. It's a very damaging thing to do to a child, to teach the child that it should be able to get away with anything and that it is the centre of the parent's universe. And I see a lot of parents making this very large mistake uh, bringing up their children. The problem is that these kind of children grow into an adult who believes themselves to be always right and, and to be the centre of the universe. And this obviously is a very distorted view of reality and obviously will cause huge amounts of problems in a relationship. Now, usually those kind of people attract a person who believes themselves to be wrong most of the time mm. because otherwise no one else could live with them. And so there is a, you can see the, the idea of codependence beginning to form. And, and this is what the problem is, is if one or both arrogantly believe that they are always right in some way, and they've grown up from their childhood to believe that they should be the centre of the universe, of another person's universe too, mm -hmm. then, then that means that they are going to have some deep difficulties having a real close, emotionally open relationship with their partner. Because what you were going to talk in a minute about um, feeling superior also, um, this arrogance is also linked to not just feeling right, is it? It's also linked to feeling of having more worth yeah. over the other person. So when we're in a humble relationship, neither of us believes ourselves to be superior to the other. Exactly. There is true equality in the relationship. Many religious uh, viewpoints are co completely opposite to this opposite to this concept or idea. If you look at the Christian viewpoint, it's that the man is the head of his household. So he has, uh, although they say that the man and the woman are equal, he has the final decision. Well, in God's relationship with God's, you know, the way God defines relationship, no one has the need for a final decision. And so, we, you know, this is something that we need to address. And in fact, from God's perspective, the most loving person should make the final decision, actually. And if we examine the Muslim view, it's very, very similar. There, there are similarities, ironically, between both religious concepts, even though both religions historically have been at loggerheads with each other. They ironically have almost identical concepts when it comes to family life. Well, they all come from the same <laughs> culture. It, it Correct. So, which is the reason why? Yeah. Exactly. Yes. And if you look at the the concept that was around when we were first born in the first century, it was a it, there was a great a lot of skew towards the male being dominant in in the environment, and and whether the male or the female is dominant in the relationship, 
it is wrong and therefore unequal. And usually it is because one has a sense of arrogance and the other has a sense of inferiority that causes such a dominance by one gender over the other in a relationship. And what we're suggesting is humility would not allow that to occur. Yeah. And, and wouldn't allow that to occur and wouldn't allow it to occur within oneself or to let the partner have that happen to them. Yeah. So we, neither of us would feel superior to the other and neither of us would feel inferior to the other and neither of us would allow that state in the other, a yes. feeling of superiority or super inferiority. And we would each value each other's worth to be equal to the other, Yeah. And which is a very, very important part of a relationship. By the way, it's a very, very important part of love generally. <laughs> you know, we shouldn't, we shouldn't believe anybody in the world is superior to, uh, to ourselves or inferior to ourselves. But this often carries through into relationships, unfortunately, and causes a lot of damage inside of relationships. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Okay. When we're in a humble relationship, I and my partner always desire to be loving and true. Oh, sorry. Let's say truthful and honest, no yes. matter what the cost or yes. the perceived cost. Yes. So a person who's humble will always admit to the truth and not only admit to it, but desire it and desire to be truthful. So, so it's not reluctant admittance to truth, but rather a deep longing within the soul to be truthful and honest in all circumstances and situations, including honest and truthful with every single one of your personal emotions. Now, most couples that I've observed struggle immensely with this. They are not humble enough to actually declare the truth to their partner or to allow the partner to declare the truth to them and for the relationship to remain. Yeah. So what happens if your partner says, oh, I had a feeling of attraction towards this lady today? Now, in this circumstance of humility, both of you would cope with that being declared. In <laughs> because you both desire that level of honesty between each other. Correct. Yeah, and also you can't fix a problem that you don't know about or that the other person or both of you are not recognising. So if so certainly if there's an attraction, someone towards another party outside of the relationship, then obviously both of you need to know about it and both of you need to work on what is this that's caused this attraction to occur and why aren't we as attracted to each other as what we thought. These are all issues that need to be raised. But unfortunately, most people don't have that level of truthfulness or honesty in their relationship. And as a result, there is no emotional closeness. And as, as a result of no emotional closeness, there is also generally little sexual closeness, closeness in long term relationships. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, very true. OK, also in this humble relationship, we both desire to be loving with each other. Yes. So I need to have a focus that I want to love you. I want to do what's loving to you. I want to be honest and truthful, as we talked about in our previous comment, mm -hmm. but I also want to love you. I want to care for you. I want to be kind to you and compassionate of you, compassionate of your circumstances and your emotional injuries and your feelings and all of those things. I want to do that. Not that I'm forced into doing that. Yeah, there's a right? big difference. There's a huge difference between or those I two states. Or I feel obliged or it's the right thing to do. Or, or I do it only because you do it to me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> In other words, uh, as long as you do it to me, I'll do it to you. But if you don't do it to me, then all bets are off. <laughs> no, that's not what pure love does. Pure love is like that under all circumstances and under all pressures. And also, we mentioned here, it's the desire to be loving. So it's not that we're perfect in love 100% of the time. Yeah, it's yeah. because remember, we're having to face it, we're probably wrong about Well, a this lot is of a things. part of the humility section that we're talking about. Yeah. You know, part of humility is recognising that we're not loving all the time. But having that desire, yes. that's what creates a humble relationship yes. between the two. And parties. if we're truly humble, we would recognise when we don't have that desire mm -hmm. and we would deal with that in yeah. some way, whether that's taking action to leave the person or taking action to develop that love that's within us, so, yeah, that's cap we're capable of developing um, for the person that we originally had so that we can enter this or re-enter this kind and compassionate and understanding state. Mm. Mm. So, which leads us to the next point, which is about experiencing emotion. 
Yes. So in the humble relationship, both of us desire to express and experience our own emotion mm -hmm. rather than involving the other party mm -hmm. in our emotional experience. So we want to do it for ourselves. Or, and we don't want to suppress our own emotional experience or the experience of our partner. Yes, boy, you see all of these things happening in a terrible way in most relationships. And it's viewed as love, <coughs> isn't it? Yeah, yeah, unfortunately, it is viewed as love. So if we, take, if we dissect this comment mm -hmm. into the three sections, the yeah. first section was? We, we want to express and experience our own emotion for ourselves without involving the other party. Right. Now that, if you just let that set with, set with you for a bit, you can see that the average person doesn't do this. The average person wants other people to know what they feel. Isn't that why you have a husband? So he can so, be there when you're upset? Exactly. And make it all better? They need someone to be validate. there for them, yeah. is the saying, as yeah. the saying goes. Well, no, a good relationship doesn't need the other person to be there for you. A good relationship is that you're there for the other person and that you don't need the other person to be there for you. And the binding force is not sharing in the suppression or the troubles of the other par partner. It's in this striving for love and striving Correct. for truth and striving to assist the other person. Sure, if, if, if it's from a few, pure place, yes. but not to help, not to demand that the other person become engaged with your emotion, Correct. which is really asking them to be engaged in your emotional suppression because you can't actually... Well, it's actually asking them to be engaged in your addiction. Addiction, And yeah. your addiction is that you need them to feel anything. Yeah. And God doesn't, in a, in a pu place of pure love, you don't need anyone other than God to feel anything. Yeah. So, yeah. so this is a very distorted viewpoint of love that the world has, and it's a part of humility. We must learn to feel and experience our own emotions without demanding anybody else share in that experience. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the demand upon somebody else is unloving and, and, and damaging, in fact, to their soul if they respond to it. So It's very damaging as well, isn't it, to create that in your uh, partnership and then in your family unit because eventually everyone gets terrified to have their own emotional experience without involving someone else, yes. even if they initially didn't feel that way. Yes. Because there's a lot of... Um, codependence that's created. Yes. We could say grown-ups feel their own emotion without needing someone else to share in it with them. Yeah. That's what a grown-up does. Yeah. God wants you to be a grown-up. <laughs> <laughs> so we need to say that. And now being humble is a part of being a grown-up. So humble, in this phase of it, we're talking, and we've got two more phases of the emotional experience to talk about with humility. But in this particular phase, what we're saying is that if you are willing and desire to go through your own emotional experience without involving someone else in that experience, then you are being far more humble and therefore far more desirous of feeling your own emotion. Mm than you would be if you share or shared or want, wanted somebody else to experience your emotions with you. Yeah. So that, that's number one part of this, this section point. that we're talking about, about, about emotions in humility. Mm. Now, the second part was... The second part is about involving the other party in the suppression of emotion. Yes. Now, quite frequently we notice, and, and again, it's a very popular <laughs> thing to do, is that I want the other person to make my negative emotion, usually it's done with negative emotion, but also it's done with positive emotion, I want it to be satisfied or go away. Now, satisfied in a sense, like let's say I have some sexual feelings for my partner, then I want my partner to satisfy them. Mm -hmm. Or go away, meaning let's say I feel like crying, I want my partner to make me happy again, to cheer me up, right? These are methods that we're using to suppress our own emotions, and we're basically manipulating our partner into agreeing with that way of dealing with our emotions. Mm -hmm. And it's very, it's a lack of humility that causes us to do this, and it's very damaging in the long term to relationships. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. All right, and then so. So the third part. The third part is about the emotional experience of our partner.
Yes. So we don't want to suppress the emotional experience of our partner either. Yes, so we see that happening a lot too, don't you? Yeah. Like, so, so for example, uh, the guy gets angry about something and so he goes outside and bashes and crashes and beats her. And inside the woman's going, how can I shut him down? How can I shut him down? It's scaring me. <laughs> yeah. He's yeah. scaring me. Fear is usually the main trigger for doing this. It's scaring me. Uh, what do we notice guys do? Well, the lady starts crying in the relationship and the guy's going, what do I do? What do I do? How do I fix it? How do I fix it? How, am I responsible? I don't know. <laughs> and so he tries to shut down her tears, yeah, yeah. right? He tries to make it all go away. He tries to alleviate her distress and really alleviate his own distress mm -hmm. through her having the experience. Now, a person who's humble doesn't do that. He, he lets himself feel how he feels about his partner crying. Yeah. Right? yeah. Rather than trying to stop his partner from crying. Yeah. 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 So to summarize this last point, which is really actually quite vital, isn't it? Yeah, maybe it's... I can give another illustration where I see it happen before you summarize. Yeah. And that is uh, the illustration of sexual relationship. Mm -hmm. Because I see this happening a lot in sexual relationship where the male has a desire for his woman and she's trying to shut him down quite significantly yeah. by doing all sorts of things to avoid mm -hmm. the con connection of sexual desire or Distracting, passion. being condescending, yes. uh, picking a fight, all kinds of yeah, things. Yeah, being busy, trying to yeah. be busy when, with unnecessary things. You know, there's all sorts of things that happen under those circumstances. And this is another way of avoiding an emotion. Yeah. So people need to realise that a lot of things that happen during their sexual relationship is also about avoiding emotion, which is a lack of humility. Mm. Mm. And often women use sex to avoid other emotions. When they do wish to engage with sex, often they're doing it to suppress other fearful emotions, a sense of being unattractive, these kinds of exactly. things, which is not a pure way to engage sex. Definitely not. And it's certainly not giving. It's no. actually demanding something f for the activity. Yeah. So, so none of these things are actually loving. And so if we're humble, we would recognize these particular things as all attempts to emotionally either suppress ourselves or others or to manipulate ourselves or others into the suppression of emotion rather than the true self-responsible feeling of emotion. Mm. <laughs> Okay, let's summarise that point. Yes. So let's say grown-ups. <laughs> grown-ups. <laughs> grown-ups want to experience their own emotions. Yes. For themselves. Without needing somebody without else to needing share. Without someone else. <laughs> so what they don't do is try to engage their partner in helping them experience their emotion or sharing in their emotion. Correct. They don't attempt to involve their partner in suppressing their emotion, to yes. trying to make them feel better or feel... Or to help their emotion. Yep, so that was the first point, wasn't yeah, it? Helping yeah. them to feel their emotion? No, yeah, mean? well, it, it, I mean in terms of, it, remember that some emotions we want to suppress and some emotions we'd like to have, ah, right? Yes. In other words, so we don't involve our partner in cheering us up yeah. or suppressing our emotion. Yeah. Let's say we're afraid and our partner tries to make our fear go away. So we don't try to make our partner make the emotion stronger. Heighten it. Heighten yeah. it or make it go away. Yeah. Either yes. way, yes, I is, is suppressing. Yeah. yeah, like, come on, I'm having fun. Yeah, make more fun with me. That's exactly. Like, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Turn on the music loud because I don't. I want to drown out the fact that you're having a bad day. <laughs> <laughs> all yeah. right. So put on beady music so that we can all feel good. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of ways I see it, it being manipulated in relationships, but we're we're now digressing and not yeah. having our summary. <laughs> That happens a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, summary. Yeah. Grown-ups want to experience our own emotion for mm -hmm. ourselves. Yes. So we want to express it and experience it. Yes. We don't want to involve our partner in helping us to experience our emotion. Mm -hmm. We don't want to involve our partner in helping us to suppress or heighten an emotion. Mm -hmm. And we do not try to suppress or heighten or heighten or share in the emotional experience of our partner correct <laughs> we got just it. that one thing alone the average couple on the planet just needs a lot of work <laughs>
<laughs> because yeah. it's, a, it's a huge area. So, and, and it's a huge minefield when it comes to uh, problems in a relationship as well. So that's why we've listed it. Yeah. What I notice is that most people feel that without doing all of those things, there is no relationship. Correct. That is the basis of the relationship well, and the, the value of the relationship. Well, that's for the them. addiction in their relationship. Yeah. Their addiction in the relationship is that I, I have a relationship with you because I want you to feel my emotions and I want you to share my emotions and I want you to help me. Cheer me up or cheer make me up or make me happy or, or, or put me down, you know, yeah. or whatever I need. What, you know, the opposite of usually whatever I, you know, whatever I want, the opposite of what I'm feeling. And, and most parties in the, in the world, most, most people in relationships in the world view that as a good relationship. Yeah. And actually, from God's perspective, it is a terrible relationship. <laughs> Which doesn't exist as a relationship. Well, from God's or... perspective, it's not pure love. And you certainly are not going to ever have a soulmate relationship based on that particular thing. Mm -hmm. you, if, you, if you don't work on that particular, that one thing alone, you will never have a soulmate relationship. Even if your person you're with is your soulmate, you're still never going to have a soulmate relationship. A soulmate relationship is not dependent on that. <laughs> so, so I think that was the last point That's of humility. That's the last point. And so when we look at these points of humility, you can see that the majority of relationships fail even when it comes to humility. The, either one or both parties do not you know, fit into this desire for true humility inside of their relationship. Now, we're going to talk later about how to develop some humility in relationships and so forth. But, but at this point, we wanted to suggest that these particular things are essential if you want to have a good relationship and certainly essential if you want to have a relationship when you're at one with God. Because if you're at one with God, these things become automatic processes inside of the relationship. Yeah. You'll never get to be one with God unless you deal with these issues. Correct. Yeah. And this is where I feel a lot of people are hoping they'll become at one with God without addressing these particular issues. And it's physically and emotionally impossible to be at one with God and have these particular emotional errors or have the lack of humility inside of a relationship. Yeah. So humility in the relationship, just like humility in the relationship with God, is what I feel of paramount importance to developing the relationship. And I feel we're never going to develop humility in our relationship with God if we can't do it with the person in front of us. Exactly. If you can't do it with someone who you can see. Who you can have sex with. <laughs> exactly. Who you can have sex with and have some nice feeling from yeah. immediately, immediately without having to feel very much, yeah. then it's highly unlikely you're going to do it with God. Yeah. Highly unlikely. Yeah. And, and yet I think the majority of people feel the opposite. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and this is strange to me because it feels to me, no, your relationship has a great opportunity to, to actually improve your relationship with God. But if you're avoiding this aspect of humility in your relationship, then you are definitely avoiding this same aspect of humility in your relationship with God. Yeah. And I also wanted to say, sorry, um, that, that the, there is an important thing we need to consider, and that is, Humility is the keystone of any relationship. So, so we need to have humility before we can have any relationship, let alone a relationship with God or a relationship with a partner. Yeah. Humility is the key in that relationship. Now, it's one of the foremost qualities that we need to develop if we're ever going to have any kind of good relationship and definitely any kind of loving relationship. Yeah. We need humility. You were going to say. <laughs> <laughs> I get so excited. Um, I was going to say that a lot. I, you mentioned about how people often feel that they're going to be able to establish humility with God and avoid it in their relationship, or yeah. they think it's going to be easier with God than it is with their partner. It's harder. And can I explain why? Uh, yep. <laughs> <laughs> it's harder because God's quieter. Your relationship isn't your, your part, partner isn't quiet generally. They'll tell you when something's wrong. Well, God's not going to tell you when something's wrong. You just won't feel God's love into you. And you've got to be very, very sensitive to feel not or feel or not feel God's love into you to notice what's going on a lot of the times. So, so God is not going to yell at you. God's not going to say something to you when you disconnect from God. Your partner likely will. <laughs> so that's why if, if you're not being humble with your partner, then it's highly unlikely you will ever be able to be humble with God. 
Yeah, and I feel that people very much misunderstand the quality of humility when they say, when they have that attitude. And, and I've had a lot of people say to me, oh, it's much easier for you because your partner is much more perfect in love. And that's a, It's actually that's, harder. Yes. In some ways. In because, some ways. Well, in a lot of ways, oh. because, because you've got to be more personally sensitive yep. than otherwise. That's right. And, but also... I mean the person who's the sorry. <laughs> I mean the person who's of a of what they might classify as a lower condition has to be more personally sensitive because they won't know when they're injuring their partner as much as their partner will know. Exactly. Right. And as a result of that, if you truly want to develop a, a relationship in love, that partner, the more loving they become, the more like God they will become. Right. So they will just instead of saying something to you, they'll just walk away. And you won't even know why. <laughs> and also they, they, will, they will tolerate your error. Much, there's a much finer, um, like you said, they'll walk away. Or yeah, there's less the, tolerance of the error. Yes. Yes. There's, less, there's a lot of patience, but less tolerance of the error. Exactly. And that is very, very confusing to a person who's in a lower condition of love. So, yeah, there's a lot of reasons why... A relationship with a partner developing humility is essential and also it will help you greatly in your relationship with God. And I still didn't get my point out. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> um, which was really the misconception that humility can is easier to cultivate. It, humility is, a, for me, it's a quality that I need to cultivate from within myself. And my errors exist within me, and mm. I must develop the desire to confront my errors. Mm -hmm. And really having a person who's loving in front of me, sure, that, is, that assists me, but it's not, it's not the key work that I have to do. It doesn't make it easier necessarily. Well, it confronts to... more of the errors as well. Yeah. So which it's actually I... more challenging. It is, mm. which I now value, mm. but which I feel a lot of people misunderstand. Correct, correct. And decide that it'll be easier with God than it is with their partner, when in fact, it's the same deal. You no, well, to... well, it's actually going to be more confronting with God than with their partner. Yeah, yeah. That's the beauty of having the relationship with God. Yeah. It will help you in all of your other relationships, including the one with your partner. Yeah. So, so there's a lot of people who arrogantly say about you that you've got it easier than they have. Actually, Mary's got it harder than the average person has with relationship because, no, you have, because there's a lot more confronted immediately than with the average relationship just because of the differing conditions and one person being more connected with God than the other. There's a lot, there's a lot more confrontation of the person's personal, not confrontation of the person in terms of of competition or attack, but confrontation of the person's condition. And, and I feel people don't understand that very much. The average woman on this planet wouldn't be able to live with me for five minutes, let alone 24 hours, right? And the average woman on the planet, by the way, and the average man on the planet doesn't live with God for any longer than a second or two a day at the most. At the most. Right? That's the reality. They don't live with God any longer than that. And that's because of the lack of humility, right? So, so the more humility we have in the relationship, we will have far greater ability to grow, to have a close relationship, to grow in love, to grow in truth. It's just going to be wonderful, but it can be quite confronting initially because almost every single personal opinion we have is probably wrong about love and probably wrong about truth, and probably wrong about what makes a good relationship. And we need to give all that up, and that's, what a part, that's also a part of humility. Mm. Yeah. So I feel this section on humility is number one. We need to focus on, in the relationship, both of us being humble, both of us having what we listed, but obviously there's a lot more aspects of humility we haven't discussed, but, but these are some primary aspects of humility. And in fact, the, if the average couple just practice those particular things we have mentioned, they would find their relationship improve immeasurably. Their relationship would be far better than it currently is. Yeah. Mm. yeah. What does a love of God's truth look like in the relationship? 
Yes, well, I, I feel, again, if I just have some general comments about it and then we talk about some specifics that we've mm -hmm. written down. But mm -hmm. again, um, we need to see the importance of God's truth in the relationship. And, and a person who doesn't believe in God, well, you could say, what is the importance of pure truth? You know, the real absolute truth in the relationship. Now, the importance of truth cannot be underestimated, in my opinion. It is of supreme value in any relationship. Without truth, no trust can develop. There can be no real love. There can be no faith that in certain circumstances and situations, love will be present without truth being present. Mm -hmm. And there can be no trust of the other party in the relationship if the other party is, has been shown to be in the past untruthful. So it is a huge part of developing trust and honour and love in the relationship. And without truth, a trusting, honest, open relationship cannot exist. Now, let's examine it from God's truth perspective, not just from truth. Mm -hmm. From God's truth perspective, God is the being of the universe that has all truth. So God's truth is highly important inside of the relationship because it is quite frequent inside of the relationship that our personal ideas of what are true are wrong. Mm -hmm. And at some point, one or both of us is going to have to accept that. And if both of us can accept that right at the beginning, that we both do not understand pure truth, that we are not purely and openly truthful with each other about everything, and we have to use that as the guideline of having a decent relationship. And if we go one step further, if we have a relationship with God, that our goal is actually to learn what God's truth is and practice it in the relationship, then we have the ability to have a very successful relationship. We also need to point out at this introductory phase that a soulmate relationship is not possible at all without truth without God's truth, actually. So there are many soulmates in the spirit world that have a relationship, but they don't have a complete soul union-based relationship because they're in the sixth sphere and they're still blocking all of the truth that can come from God. Only those people who reach a soul union condition, which is the joining of both halves of the soul, mm -hmm. are those people who have accepted the truth, the universal truth or God's truth about all the issues associated with their relationship in particular, and also about many other truths of the universe. So, so unless there is a dedication on the part of both parties in a relationship towards truth, sooner or later, the relationship is going to come under strain. Yeah. Yep. And so that's what we need to say at the outset. Yeah. Now let's look at some of what that looks like inside of a relationship. What does it look like if I'm focused on God's truth in yes. the relationship? So if we both love God's truth in the relationship and we're both seeking God's truth, we don't arrogantly believe that we already know what God's truth is before we work on the issues. Yes. So, so in other words, we don't just assume that uh, we are God, because <laughs> really, if you believe you know all of God's truth, then really you believe you're God. Now, there are religions and New Age philosophies that say you are, which are very harmful to relationships, actually, because they basically teach you that you are God and therefore you are, you know, you do know everything. You just have to be conscious of it or whatever their explanation of it is. Yeah. The reality is you're not God. You never will be God. So therefore you will never know all of God's truth. However, God has the capacity to give you all of God's truth or as much of God's truth as you desire to absorb. And if both parties in a relationship desire to absorb it, then you have a hope of actually seeing your own flaws and your own inadequacies and your own untruthful behavior and changing it. Mm -hmm. But without that, you can't see these inadequacies in the relationship, and so the relationship will not grow. Yeah. yeah. Truth is essential for the growth of the relationship. Well, it, I feel it binds people together in relationships. Yes. The, the, a combined desire for and honour of truth is the only thing that it, brings people together. It also brings trust. It, 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 the beauty of truth is that when I know that you're 100% truthful with me and you know that I'm 100% truthful with you, you know you can trust the person. You know whatever they're thinking, whatever they're feeling, 
that you will eventually know it even if you don't ask because the other person's honest about it. You will know that you can trust what they're, what they're doing. You know that when they say, no, they haven't slept with Mrs. Jones down the street, that they haven't slept with Mrs. Jones down the street and you can bank your life on it, right? But, but a person who hasn't got that kind of truth in a relationship obviously has no trust in the relationship either. Yeah, yeah, hmm? yeah. Okay. Um, another aspect, if we love God's truth in the relationship, both of us focus on always discovering what God's truth is about an issue rather than holding on to our own personal truth yep. or attempting to compromise by having two different versions of personal truth. Yes. Now, I see this happening so many times in relationships. What they do is they say to each other or and to themselves, none of us really know what the truth is. So what we're going to do is I'll have my truth and you can have your truth and we'll just make some compromises wherever those two things disagree, right? Now that is not ever going to be a relationship which is actually a very strong relationship in the long run. There is this concept, the world concept of relationship is the more you compromise in the relationship, the better the relationship becomes. That's the world view. And God's view is no compromise should ever be necessary in a relationship. That's right, yeah. <laughs> Most people believe that no relationship is possible and less compromise. Correct. Yeah. And it's very sad, isn't it? I find that basically the global feeling about truth is that you can never find an absolute truth, yes. like the global injury. And they might not say that about God even, but within their personal relationships, that's what they believe. Yes. And which indicates there's some some inconsistencies in their personal belief system. Correct. Uh, and also that as a result, they believe that compromise has to happen for there to be any kind of harmony. Yes. Yeah. And if you go along to a marriage counsellor, for example, on the planet, most marriage counsellors would definitely advise compromise in mm -hmm. the relationship. And what I'm saying here is that actually no compromise is necessary in the relationship or to say it more clearly, no compromise with each other is necessary in the relationship. But both of you will have to compromise when it comes to God's truth because <laughs> God's truth is true and both of you will need to change in order to accept it. Yeah, yeah. We're... <laughs> I don't want to make this about me, but I just <laughs> think on. about uh, examples within our relationship where, you know, often when a couple is moving towards God's truth together, it's just as you said, where there's a compromise and both, if they're sincerely seeking, have to seek in God's truth. They both have to face some personal pain or frustration or fear in order to move forward. Mm. But very often in the beginning of our relationship, especially, it, you would be pointing out, pointing out a truth and I would sit with it and reason about it and realize it's true. And because you'd already accepted the truth, it was smooth sailing for you. But for me, <laughs> it was exactly. weeks of confrontation. Yes. Yeah. And this is what a person would need to understand too, that if they start accepting God's truth, there are at times going to be weeks or even months of internal conflict going on yeah. that they'll need to work through emotionally in order to accept God's truth. And this is why God's truth needs to be the benchmark of the relationship, not your personal truth. Your personal truth and your desire to hold on to it is a very flawed concept when it comes to having a decent relationship. If you think about it logically, if God does exist, then God would know how best for you to have a relationship, you know, what mm -hmm. the best things for you to do are to have a relationship. Now, my suggestion to any person who believes in God is that you must understand what God believes is a good relationship before you'll have one, <laughs> yeah. because you definitely won't have a good relationship before then. Mm -hmm. And that is going to require that both of you accept God's truth about relationships rather than holding on to your own ideas and concepts about what makes a good relationship. Yeah. Yeah, so that, and, and that requires both of you changing to have God's view. Mm -hmm. Right now, if we take it from the point of view as absolute truth, so a person doesn't believe in God, then of course it's a bit more difficult. If a person uh, believes in the concept of absolute truth, 
then we're fine because mm -hmm. it, then then both parties know if both parties believe in that concept that there is an absolute truth in this particular situation and whatever that absolute truth is is what we both need to agree upon right yeah. at, at some point now my and that absolute truth may be may be in disagreement with both of their individual personal truths mm -hmm. right but for them to know the difference is very difficult yeah and that's why it's very very difficult without god in the relationship to actually work through this issue of truth in a relationship and it's also why the majority of people without god in a relationship eventually hang on to the concept that each has their personal truth and they need to compromise yeah yep. yeah Okay, mm. um, so love of God's truth in a relationship, the third aspect we mentioned is that both partners honour truth over their own partner's personal emotional beliefs and injuries. So here we're talking, we've talked about letting go of personal opinions, if you like, in the last um, point. Yeah. But here we're talking about we're honouring truth over the injury of the other person, which yes. while it's very related to opinion and belief, there's, there's more to it, isn't there? Yes, well, the injury usually triggers a whole group of emotions, emotions such as fear and anger and other emotions like that that are difficult to address and deal with. And if we truly love truth, we will actually say the truth even if we or the other person gets angry or afraid or has some other emotional reaction to the truth. In other words, what we're saying here is the emotional reaction to the truth does not matter. And in fact, we allow the person, because of the first question we answered yes. about humility, we allow the person to have their emotional reaction to the truth, mm -hmm. but it does not stop us from saying the truth. Yeah. <laughs> and I see this, unfortunately, being a big problem for most relationships. It definitely does stop most people from saying the truth when they know their partner is going to get angry yeah. or they know their partner is going to, you know, be resentful or they know their partner is going to withdraw sex for four weeks if they say something. Yeah. You know, then, of course, they don't say anything. And, <laughs> and that is just an emotional response to the truth. And what we need to learn to do with each other and ourselves is to allow the emotional response to the truth, work through the emotional response to the truth by feeling it and addressing it, but don't allow the emotional response to the truth to help us avoid stating the truth. Yes. That's what we need to learn to do. One of my favourites is in a couple where... Um, Somebody says, look, I can't tell my partner about the affair that I had because it'll hurt them. <laughs> and I say, when you had the affair, you hurt them. Correct. It's not the telling of them. Actually, telling them is, is a loving act because yes. it's, it's bringing truth into the relationship. It's allowing them to yes. make better decisions. And all Not only that, the, the statement itself is untruthful. Mm. The only reason why the person isn't saying the truth about their affair is because they're afraid of what will happen to them if they state the truth, not to their partner. Yes. Right, they're afraid their partner might leave them or they're afraid their partner might get angry or they're afraid their partner might shoot them or something, you know, something, you know they're afraid of the potential violence that might trigger or whatever. Yeah. And that's why they're avoiding saying the truth. Yeah. So in other words, they're afraid of their own emotional experience. So it's actually a more selfish motivation that causes them to not speak the truth. Yeah. They're worried about how they'll handle, personally handle, the response of their partner. Yeah, and a lot of us make excuses, don't we, that we're protecting our partner when really we're yes. being cowards. Yeah, about we're our... protecting ourselves. Yeah. Let's get honest about yeah. it. Yeah. And the person who's really truthful would know that. Yeah. They would know that the main reason why they withhold truth is because they want to protect themselves, so they're afraid. Yeah. And fear isn't a good reason, as I've said about any emotion. Fear, anger, sadness, whatever, is not a good reason to withhold the truth. Yeah. And we need to honour that in the relationship. Yeah. We don't withhold truth for any emotional reason. Whatever it is, whatever justification you have, none of those justifications are worth breaking this concept of holding on to truth in your relationship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm. Okay. Mm. A love of God's truth means that both of us stop living in codependent addictions and in our facades with each other. Yes. Now, we again see this occurring quite a lot. 
Now let's look at a facade, for example. A facade is a false presentation of myself to another person. Mm -hmm. Now, if I love truth, I would not have it. So you see this in a lot of beginning relationships, you know, where they, they start off and both parties are completely in the facade with the other party. Yeah. And, and this is an indication that they haven't learnt this basic principle about relationship. And what they do is they establish a relationship based on facade and then slowly the facade gets pulled away and then eventually both of them say, you're not the person I started having a relationship with which is very true because both of you <laughs> <laughs> were, in a, were completely different people, yeah. right? Yeah. So, of course, uh, a facade, having a facade in a relationship is a primary cause of breakdown of relationships yeah. over time. This is why relationships often start out looking good yeah. and then finishing up a year later, two years later, or even three months later, looking terrible because now they're out of the facade and they're in their reality, their real emotions, their yeah. real state, their real truth. And in that place, you know, they don't get along at all. No. So, so you can see giving up facade is essential if you're ever going to have a good relationship. Yeah. And we'll talk about that in depth, won't we, in a, in a latter question. Yes, and also in the coming assistance groups yes. in uh, 2016, we talk about, you know, the facade and the effect it has on relationships, including our relationship with God. Yeah. Very damaging to relationships, yeah. holding on to a facade. And you mentioned a relationship breaking down after a year or three months. So some people live in their facade for 20 years in their, in their marriages. Some it's do. It's harder to maintain. It's hard it? to maintain. Yeah. But and honestly, when they do, their soul condition starts influencing their bodies in such a way that there are problems that occur in their body as a result. So in the end, they have illnesses and diseases that they wouldn't normally have if they didn't have the facade mm -hmm. that come up as part of the tri tribulations of their relationship anyway. Yeah. So, if, for example, a woman trying to have sex when she's actually feeling like she doesn't really want to have sex and she has anger about it and she suppresses that anger and tries to please her husband by having sex with him, eventually she's going to have all sorts of genital issues or, you know, uh, what they call women's problems <laughs> in her body as a result of that particular emotion being, you know, being suppressed within her. She's far better off being honest and then she wouldn't have those particular problems. So, so yes, it's important to understand that even if you have a facade of 20 years or 10 years or whatever, how long you've maintained one, it does cause a degradation to the relationship in many ways through physical ailments and issues occurring. Mm. So uh, that's the first aspect. The second aspect of this particular statement is the aspect of addictions. Yeah. And basically, these are codependencies. Well, I'll scratch your back if you scratch mine type of thing. I'll do this for you if, as long as you do that for me. Now, the problem with this is that as soon as one party stops doing what they're doing, then the other party will get resentful and also stop what they're doing. And immediately you have a breakdown in the relationship and no love. And in fact, it's not a love based relationship in the first place. It's a bartering system. You've made an agreement. You might as well have sit, sat down and said, what we do for me? Yes, I agree to that. What will I have to do for you in return? Yes, I agree to that. And there's the basis of our relationship. Isn't that what they sign at the church? Are they? <laughs> <laughs> well, basically, but, but most people don't even are not intelligent enough about it to even just create it like a document, you know, like a hundred page document which says, I'll do all these things for you as long as you do all these things for me. Now, of course, such a relationship is not based upon love. It's based upon codependent addictions. It, it, it is very, very damaging in the long term. And while those relationships often survive for the entire of the Earth's condition, mm -hmm. they break up in the spirit world almost immediately anyway. Yeah. Because after a while, people start realising that these addictions are harmful, that they cause sin. And sin, the effects of sin are things like degradation of the body, disease, sickness and other effects that are all the results of a person engaging in the sin of codependent addiction. And it is a sin from God's perspective to engage in codependent addiction. And we need to start seeing it as such. Right? Codependent addiction causes huge amounts of problems in relationships and is one of the main reasons why people revert to compromise and are hiding the truth from their partner they begin engaging other relationships while they have relationships and so forth uh, to feed these codependent addictions and facades. Mm -hmm. And many relationships on this planet as a result are a complete facade. Mm -hmm. They are a complete facade. They are completely 
like what you see is definitely not what you get. Mm. Yep. And sooner or later, both parties in the relationship generally become aware of that. Yeah. And so those kind of relationships are very dissatisfying. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Uh, the last two you've already touched upon. Mm -hmm. and that These is are aspects of truth. As of what it looks like when we love God's truth in, in the, the relationship. relationship. Yep. And that is that we stop creating harmony so-called harmony with yep. each other for the sake of peace rather than creating real harmony by being truthful and honest. Correct. See, a lot of people want to lie because it gives the, the Im image of harmony, but it's not real harmony. The soul the soul's in disharmony still. The feelings inside of the soul is in disharmony. So, for example, if I lie to you about a, an infidelity, then I've already created disharmony in the relationship. And if I lie about it, I, I, our, our relationship is not more harmonious. It's only the illusion of more harmonious. Mm -hmm. That's all. Mm -hmm. And so if I'm addicted to the illusion, I might do that. But if I'm addicted, if I really want to have truth in the relationship and really want to have closeness in the relationship, I'll have to declare what I did yeah. and even examine the reasons why if I want to repair the relationship. So a person who's really truthful in a relationship desires that they desire to have a real relationship rather than a peaceful relationship mm -hmm. the irony is is that if, if you are both humble and you're both loving and you both have a desire for god's truth there will also be peace in the relationship yeah right but it won't be created through the illusion of harmony it'll be created through actual harmony Mm. When we live in denial of so many things, it might appear to be smooth on the surface, but there's always so much. If there's not um, other un like severe undercurrents going on, there's a deep level of dissatisfaction personally, isn't yes. there, in each, uh, in each person. In each individual. Whether they acknowledge it or not. Correct. W because they're in denial, they often don't want to acknowledge it. No. But. And this is why relationships often degrade over time, because the dissatisfaction level increases over time, both parties don't want to be humble about it, don't want to face the truth about it, and as a result, they continue the harmony, so-called harmony, the illusion of harmony. They continue that illusion rather than being honest with themselves and having to work through the issues. Once you work through the issues, and that process may not be very peaceful if both one or both parties have a, an unloving tendency towards a lack of humility or a lack of truth or a lack of love, then it certainly won't be peaceful. Mm -hmm. But in the end, peace will come about as a result of working through those issues in harmony with love, truth and humility. So I encourage everybody to give up the illusion of harmony and work through to having real peace in a relationship by embracing the principles of humility, truth and love. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, final point that we already have touched on, which is that if we both love God's truth in the relationship, we stop compromising with each other and we stop slowly withdrawing from each other as a result of these continual compromises. Yes. I feel that before we raise the issue of compromise in the, in the aspect of humility mm -hmm. um, and earlier in this with the aspect of truth, yeah. but now what we want to do is look at the results of compromise. And the results of compromise in a relationship are that we eventually detune from one another. We know that they won't like this and the, we don't like that. And we start having these compromising situations occurring where one of us or both of us are not happy with the other because of the compromises being engaged. And we become also very disappointed with the compromises generally. And, and unfortunately, if one party is compromising the aspect of truth, absolute truth, God's truth, then they'll become very disappointed very quickly. Yeah. And it creates this really, this disjointing and uh, dissolution, this mm -hmm. gradual dissolution of the relationship. And, and what happens is we emotionally step away from each other under those circumstances. And this is why a soulmate relationship is not possible without truth, because what happens is every time you, you withhold truth or you want your partner to withhold truth, you are actually stepping away emotionally from the relationship. Mm -hmm. As you step away emotionally, you cannot be emotionally close. And the more you step away emotionally, you cannot be sexually close. 
and you are leaving your relationship open to some third party coming into the relationship with who you feel more emotionally close to or more in harmony with and that person then interfering with your relationship to such a point that the relationship completely breaks down. This is what you're doing by not telling the truth, not holding on to the truth as, a, as an important fact in your, as a necessary fact for this safety and trust that needs to develop in a relationship. I see that happening a lot in marriages where over time there's compromises happening. People end up suppressing really parts of their nature or their desires mm -hmm. because they know the other one's not going to approve and they really want the approval so they they just compromise compromise the the sexual the lack of sexual attraction starts happening and mm -hmm. that's another cause for dissatisfaction and Correct. sometimes couples kind of try and compromise around that which only leads to more kind of disconnection yes. because if you compromise to have sex when you really don't want to then you're detuning from the initial lack of desire and it compounds mm. you mentioned leaving the relationship open for say a third party to come in but what i see commonly happening is that people just end up trying to fulfill some of the emotional needs, needs what they call their needs yeah like their desire for intimacy really yes with their friends of the same gender correct so so the guy share, goes off fishing with his mates and, and the, the girl girls goes share off all their you know, their worries girls. and their insecurities and their thoughts and their dreams with their female friends. Yes. And sometimes a, a, an affair might not happen in the relationship, but there's this huge yes. detunement between the two couples. So the, so the couple aren't couple. best friends. And the reality is that uh, a couple needs to be best friends if they're ever going to maintain sexual chemistry over long periods of time. Yeah. And, and sexual chemistry too is very much dependent upon truth. And the more you withdraw from truth, the more sexual chemistry will disappear. So this is something too that people need to realize is that it, it, initially when they start relationships, most people are looking for sexual, instant sexual chemistry. Yeah. This is a big flaw to look for instant sexual chemistry, not understanding that sexual chemistry develops with closeness and truth and emotional intimacy and any other kind of sexual chemistry is fully based on addiction and facade. Mm -hmm. So if you have instant sexual chemistry with a person, it's highly likely that you are in heavy addiction and facade with the person, which creates this instant sexual chemistry, which will disappear over time, not improve. Mm -hmm. If you don't learn the principles of love, truth and humility in the relationship, if you learn the principles of truth in the relationship, you might start off with hardly any sexual chemistry at all in the relationship. And then over time, as the truthfulness and the love and the humility grows in both parties, then the sexual chemistry also has the capacity to grow inside of the relationship. So, so I see a lot of people making that mistake, you know, thinking that sexual chemistry being the beginning of the relationship means that the relationship will last a long time. Mm -hmm. and, and if they follow the principles we're teaching here, often sexual chemistry at the beginning of a relationship will mean the relationship will break up over a period of time because the sexual chemistry was based on other things other than truth, love and humility. We know some couples, don't we, who are both people in the couple are striving for God's truth and for humility and to learn love from God. And um, some of them came together with strong sexual chemistry. And now they're going through this process of personal change and change in their relationship. There's hardly any sexual, any sexual chemistry. chemistry. <laughs> sure. yeah. Or that might have happened before they even met us, that there was a lack of sexual chemistry. Correct. There's a dissatisfaction in the relationship. And I often want to encourage them and say, like, just hang in there and keep going for this truth thing, for this humility thing, for this love thing, because... Yes. It, it'll come again, but especially if they're soulmates, it will come again, but in a much more fulfilling way. Well, that's probably the proviso we need to yeah. add, isn't it? Is that if a person develops humility, truth and love in their relationship and sexual chemistry does not grow, but rather wanes, then it's highly likely the couple isn't, aren't soulmates. Because with regard to soulmates, there is always a growing sexual chemistry over a period of time if they engage the principles of humility, love and truth. That's how God designed their relationship. Yeah. But you just got to be careful that the first afternoon that you decide to be truthful and there's zero sexual chemistry, you go, <laughs> you oh, that up. means yeah. we're not soulmates. It can take many years yeah. 
for a soulmate couple to develop sexual chemistry. And in fact, many soulmate couples that I meet have no sexual chemistry whatsoever, which is the reason initially why they're generally not in a relationship. And it takes many years before they even recognize that that person is actually their other half yeah. by developing these principles of truth, love and humility in themselves first. And then as they develop that, then obviously the relationship develops. Mm. Cool. So that was the issue of truth yes. in the relationship and how it looks, and particularly if we accept God's truth in a relationship. Again, we could comment that very few relationships on the planet do this, and as a result, most relationships on the planet really, really struggle, particularly after a period of time. Yeah. So initially, they may start out with that sexual chemistry and a special type of bond, but over time, that bond eventually disappears or dissipates because of them not maintaining truth in a relationship and compromising on issues of God's truth in the relationship. Mm -hmm. And in any relationship, it is truth that opens the, the pathway for a bond. So even if a partnership turns out to not be soulmates, if they're truthful with each other, there's going to be more of a bond, a, a more of a love-based relationship anyway, isn't there? Correct. And if, if it turns out that they eventually uh, disband in terms of a relationship because they recognise they're not soulmates, it's highly unlikely if they've developed these qualities of love and truth and humility that they would be upset or resentful about that breakup. Yeah. And certainly that breakup would not have any impact on the children under those circumstances, mm -hmm. which we'll talk about later in this in the partner relationship series. Yeah. We'll talk about how, you know, breakups should probably occur yeah. and also how breakups affect children and why. Yeah. Uh, because we, I think they are very important reasons why many people on the planet don't engage issues of truth, love and humility in their relationship because they're afraid of what will happen to their children yeah. if they do. And we would like to talk about those particular subjects in the future sessions. Yeah, very important ones that mm. we've got some good questions about. Yes, yeah. yes.